great to, to see everyone, a lot of old friends and stuff. We're kind of back in business here, so this is great. Okay, so I need to start off with confession. Uh, I don't have a, a near-field microscope, um, so don't leave. But uh, I'm hoping to get one in the, the raffle at the end of the, the conference. So. But the thing I am going to tell you is about a, a complementary technique. And it's a technique that is, you know, and first glance looks very similar. And a number of people, when I present at conferences, they always ask me, how does this relate to near-field microscopy? So as things kind of merge together, I think it's good to just give a, an overview of this field. And this is terahertz scanning tunneling microscopy. So, so we'll get into this in a second. First, I just want to acknowledge my group because I'm a little worried how long this talk is going to take. I have to get the important stuff out of the way first. So I am going to cover research by a number of groups, not just mine, to try to give you a snapshot of the field. But, you know, this is my group. These are the people that I work with every day. Um, you can see one of our lab dogs made the picture, not the other one, but that's still pretty good. And uh, Stephanie Adams, who's on the end here, is also at the conference, so you might get to meet her. Okay, and I, I should highlight Spencer Ammerman and Vidra Angelic, who did a lot of the work um, that, that I'll show from my lab. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to show this little picture here, not to tease you, but just to give you sort of an idea for what regime we're operating in. So of course we have our near-field microscopy, SNOM, which have, you know, I, I also worked in this field with Rupert Huber especially, and, and colleagues who are here now, Marcus Huber, Fabian Sandner. Okay, so as we all know, we shine light onto a tip apex, we have a confined field, we use that evanescent field to do lo local spectroscopy, right? Okay, the technique I'm gonna highlight is a little different. The starting point is the same. You shine light onto the tip. It's gonna be a phase stable, hopefully single cycle pulse. Let's say it's terahertz radiation. The trick is, this is now gonna be a scanning tunneling microscope. And the terahertz pulse is gonna control the tunnel current between the tip and the sample. So I'm not going to detect the scattered light. I'm going to detect the current that I generate through the tip sample junction. Okay, so first I'd like to motivate a little bit why terahertz might be a good frequency to use. So here I have our electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and what I want to distinguish is this sort of analogy of the wave versus particle picture of light, but in the um, nonlinear optics regime. So if I have, let's say, if I turn my head, you can still hear me, right? Okay. So if I have an electron that's, that's bound in this potential well, and I send in a photon, but I don't have enough energy to bring it out. Let's say I send in two photons, I can absorb both at the same time, and that would be a multi-photon process. So whether I'm in this picture, or what I'll describe as the strong field regime, depends on what's called the Keldish parameter. So this is the ratio of the ionization energy to what's called the ponder motive potential, so ponder motive energy, which is the average kinetic energy an electron gains if just accelerated in free space. Okay, so I can put in kind of the parameters of the ponder motive energy. I've got the frequency of the light, the electric field, mass of the electron, ionization energy. So if I tell you that this is in the Keldish parameter greater than one regime, this multi-photon stuff, but I keep my field constant, and let's say I start at 500 nanometers and I go to the terahertz, what's going to happen is this Keldish parameter is going to get much smaller. And when I'm in the regime of a small Keldish parameter, I shouldn't think of this as a multi-photon process. I should instead think of a quasi-static bias voltage that just tips the energy landscape back and forth. So terahertz is kind of deeply into this regime where we think of the light as this oscillating field. Okay, so we can kind of plot out um, where we're gonna be in the strong field regime, the multi-photon regime. I think Peter also has a similar paper for field emission. In this case, I did it slightly differently. I put a, a voltage bias and kind of the expected tip height for the scanning tunneling microscope. And you can draw a line up and say, do I expect to be in the strong field regime or the multi-photon regime? So for terahertz, you're sort of always in this strong field regime. There's a trade-off. You have the oscillation period. That's gonna tell you your time resolution, it turns out. But terahertz is kind of this nice little spot, but of course there's also work at other frequency ranges. Okay, so let's dig into how this works. So we start with a scanning tunneling microscope. This is sort of my circuit diagram. I've got a voltage, I've got a conducting sample, I send in my terahertz pulse, and I'm gonna be in the strong field. Now, if I have a strong field applied to a scanning tunneling microscope junction, well, what does it mean when I apply this field or voltage? I can make this little drawing. So here I have my sample. This is supposed to be a semiconductor with some electrons in the valence band, the conduction band, nothing, and then I've got the tip with electrons filled up the Fermi level. 
So if I put a bias on this, just a normal constant bias, I might have electrons go from the, the sample into the tip. This is basically I've moved the Fermi level up, or I could go the other way. So I have current flowing one way or the other way just based on this voltage. Okay, so now the terahertz is gonna apply this voltage, and it's gonna make a current, but the current is gonna be way too fast for an STM to measure, right? The lucky thing is that we can actually measure the integral of this current, so that's what we're gonna do. So we saw in a previous talk um, uh, IV curves. So in scanning tunneling microscopy, if you take an IV curve, let's say the differential conductance, this is approximately, not perfectly, but approximately proportional to the local density of the states of the sample. So this is a different type of spectroscopy than we normally do. Normally we think of what are the frequencies in my Fourier transform. In this case, you're actually changing the bias voltage, changing the alignment of the Fermi levels, and that is then changing my conductance. And that conductance is then what I'm doing spectroscopy of. Okay, so now the terahertz is gonna come in, and it is going to act as a bias voltage and oscillate up and down this current voltage characteristic. So this is the integral of this. Generating an asymmetric current pulse. If we kind of have a closer look, we'll have some voltage, we'll get a current pulse that the main peak is actually shorter than the terahertz pulse because this is a nonlinear thing I'm rectifying on. So that nonlinearity is key. Okay, but it's too fast. In fact, what happens is I send in a pulse train and I get many pulses. Those are still too fast for my electronics. So I just see a shift in the average DC current. And then because we want to measure something, we chop it on and off. And we look at the modulated current of that chopping frequency. So just sending in terahertz pulses, we have a sort of conventional STM, and we're measuring the modulated current with a lock and amplifier. And you can do this simultaneously to your normal STM. Okay, so the first uh, demonstration of this was in Frank Hegman's group. This was during my PhD. Uh, Vitor Jellick was an undergrad student at the time working uh, with me as well. And here we were imaging pump probe um, uh, terahertz STM imaging of an indium arsenide nanodot. We could see this ultra-fast charging and decay, so we basically photo-excited the substrate and the electrons trapped into these nanodots. Okay, so we were, we were pretty happy this thing worked right away, um, and we could see that we had spatial resolution down to sort of the two, one, two nanometer scale. But this was done in ambient conditions. You know, if you have some experience with scanning tunneling microscopy, you know that typically this works a bit better when you've got a very clean junction. So in ultra-high vacuum, usually it works better at low temperature as well. Additionally, if you're gonna have very good resolution, it doesn't do you too much good to have very good resolution of dirt. You need to know what you're looking at, right? So um, in Regensburg, this is where I did my postdoc with Rupert Huber, and there was a nice collaboration with Yasha Rep there. We, we took this into ultra-high vacuum, low temperatures, and measured low tunnel currents. And in this case, you can really tune that terahertz field. Remember, this is like a sort of DIDV spectroscopy. These are molecular orbital resonances. And what happens is, if you tune it so the terahertz field just drives current there, you pull electrons out one by one out of a single molecular orbital, and you can scan the tip around, and you can take an image that looks a lot like the local density of states of the sample. So, of course, it's not an image of orbital, it's the image of the electron density, so the orbital squared. Right, so that's quite fun. And, you know, STM could do something like this, but what they couldn't do is now pump probe measurements. So all these you know, electrons I'm getting are always confined in a certain time window. So you can do a pump probe measurement, right? Terahertz pulse comes in, wait some time later, another terahertz pulse comes in. So here you can see the result of a pump probe measurement where the first terahertz pulse drove tunneling, basically perturbing the molecule, and you sit over the molecule and you take electrons out one by one of a particular lobe of a particular molecular orbital, and you see the current due to the second terahertz pulse oscillate up and down as a function of time. Okay, cool, so we're kind of like, we're on board, we know this has fast time resolution and it's got almost arbitrary spatial res resolution in terms of um, uh, atoms and things. Okay, so now I kind of want to take a step back a little bit and think about what kind of information might we get out of this, okay? So here's a paper by the group of Jun, Jun Takeda and Hidemi Shigakawa showing that these terahertz pulses, you know, you can point them one way, point them one way, and sweep this field. And what we'd like to do is turn this into a kind of spectroscopy measurement, but it's gonna be like a scanning tunneling spectroscopy measurement. Okay, so Vidra and Jellick also did something similar. You can see now here's his paper during his PhD with Frank Hegman looking at a silicon seven by seven surface. In this case, I'm just gonna point out there's no bias voltage. This is a completely terahertz driven image. Turn off the bias voltage, terahertz drives all the current, set your feedback loop onto that, and you can see single atoms of silicon. Right, so then what you can do is sweep this terahertz field and kind of flip it over and sweep it again and figure out what is the 
differential conductance that the Tarot sees. And already in this sort of early work, Wiedren could see that it wasn't the same as STM. So already you're doing something different. You're looking at a AC conductivity rather than a DC conductivity. Okay, now this, this field is kind of taking off uh, since then. I, this is probably the last conference where I can put all the papers I know of in the field onto one slide. After this, I you know, need two slides or something. Um, right, I obviously can't do this for near field. Uh, too big, but uh, yeah. So this, our field, this field is growing as well and it's kind of converging together. So I, I highlighted and read these papers from my group at Michigan State. I'm gonna scan over some of these also with some divergence back into other groups as well. So let's just think a little bit about what kind of spectroscopy we could do with this terahertz driven tunneling. So here we've got a terahertz voltage pulse. You know, I'm thinking of the field as a voltage. I'm gonna then sweep my peak field and you know, it's not, just I'm directly measuring the IV curve, I'm actually integrating over this thing, and as you'll see in a moment, it gets worse once you go to a pump probe. It's more confusing to try to figure it out. But okay, I get this ultra-fast current as a function of time, this is the integral, and then I sweep this voltage, and this is what I can measure. Rectified number of electrons per terahertz pulse as a function of peak voltage. And this is the thing that we were kind of thinking about the last year or so, and thinking about can we undo this and, and just get this IV curve out. So to give us a little bit more flexibility as a technique to extract information rather than kind of proof of principle style thing. So what we found was if you make a very simple approximation, you just say the IV curve ultimately can be defined by a polynomial, then a lot of things kind of drop out of the equations. I took the equations out because I thought it'd be too long, but uh, if you check out the paper, you can see them. Um, and then there's a key here. In order to undo this, you better know what the near field waveform is. Because if it looks different than you think, then you're gonna totally trick yourself. So already we're kind of crossing over into near field microscopy because we need to know. Okay, so then we do this sweep, we just fit this with a polynomial, and if we've already made this approximation, then we can just undo it, and we can get the differential conductance out. This is a simulation, and we just see what did it, you know, what did it act on to get there. So we did a, a couple practice ones just to make sure this makes sense. You know, some sort of like roughly, uh, very strongly nonlinear, let's say, to make sure that it doesn't blow up. Uh, and then, you know, we, we put some noise on this to make sure that if we did a real measurement, it wouldn't totally mess up. Um, in this case, we had to be a little trickier. We had to fit both the rectified charge and its derivative. But ultimately, you can get something out that works pretty well, aside from the region where basically your smoothing function breaks down. Okay, so this is one type of spectroscopy that we're now starting to do with terahertz STM. But as I said, we need to know the waveform. So how are we getting this waveform out? So one approach is, is to do basically like a kind of a pump probe measurement, but with the sample far away. So you, you come in with some here optical pulse, you photo excite the tip itself, and then you do basically photo assisted field emission. You change the time delay between the terahertz and the probe, you kind of give yourself a bias voltage somewhere in here, or maybe the linear regime. And by doing this, you can do this, you know, it's almost like a streaking measurement, but it's spectrally integrated. So you can trace out this pulse, um, you know, there are, sometimes this works really well, sometimes for reasons that I'll show a little later, um, you might need a different technique. Um, this paper might be of interest to folks here, which is now this was done by Melanie Muller and the group of Martin Wolf with an ultra broad broadband source from one of these spin emitters and showed that there is quite a strong spectral response of the tip itself. So here, here is the electro-optic sampling, sort of corrected um, spectrum, and then here's what you get from this STM tip. And Conceivably, something's happening like this in near field as well, that you're getting this spectral filtering, and you know, if you had a hugely broadband pulse, probably it's gonna adjust itself at the tip apex. Okay, and here you can see the result. You start with this pulse and you get this longer one, so it's something to be aware of. Another approach to doing this, sort of a fancy approach, is to have a single molecule switch on a surface, and you basically uh, use the terahertz or you apply the terahertz to this, and its switching can actually be read out as the waveform. So this was um, work by Rupert Hooper and Yasha Rep and Don McPeller, and this is quite wonderful, right? I mean, if this is your sample, then you probably want to do it that way. Otherwise, you know, you might have to figure out which approach works best for you. So in, in my group at Michigan State University, we then took this and we said, okay, well, we want to really show that we can do this spatially resolved as well. So we, we grew these things called uh, atomically precise graphene nanoribbons, um, just briefly how this works is you start from single molecule precursors, you evaporate them onto a surface, and then you bake it like a cake, in a sense. You heat them up, it forms a polymer chain, you heat it up again, 
it has a cyclodehydrogenation reaction, and you get an atomically precise graphene nanoribbon, meaning it's the width that you wanted, and it's the edge shape that you wanted because you chose the molecules right in the first place. Okay, so here you can see a Terrat STM image. Um, this is sort of where the atoms are. This is the Terrat STM image. Effectively, what it shows us is the distribution of the electrons in the valence band. Yeah, okay, so it's quite fun. And then we started putting our tip in different locations and sweeping this field like I described, and we used a model and we could undo this, and from that we could get out the local density of states of the valence band and conduction band. And the reason this was kind of, you know, required some modeling is that the terahertz pulse, it goes both polarities, right? It goes over to the side of the valence band and it takes an electron out, and it might go back over to the side of the conduction band and put one in. And you just see the rectified charge. So you have to undo this process, and sometimes you actually see the valence and conduction band on top of each other. So here's an example. If we sweep the field and we have the terahertz pulse of one polarity or the other polarity, in one case, what looks like the valence band local density of states just kind of appears. In the other case, I'm not sure if you can really see with the lights, but there's red and blue. This is basically tunnel current in the two directions. One is electrons out, the other is electrons in. So we then apply our algorithm that we came up with, and we basically construct at every point one of these charge versus field um, uh, sweeps, and then we undo that. And by doing that, we can get out what are the sort of authentic valence and conduction bands that we think we're seeing, and then we can compare that to density functional theory. So here you have, um, you know, we had a bit of a, what you would call a tip artifact probably on the side here, but other than that, it's, you know, fairly, fairly nice. Okay, and I, I guess I should highlight, this is a scale bar here is five angstrom, so you can kind of do this on the scale of, you know, an angstrom or, or less even. Okay, but of course, what we really want to do is pump probe measurements, and, and what I'm particularly interested in is optical pump terahertz probe, not just terahertz pump terahertz probe. So the optical pump terahertz probe, what's going to happen, you're going to photo excite your sample, maybe your tip, hopefully not, but could be, then the terahertz is going to come in, and it's going to give you a rectified charge. So you've got some situation like this. You might have some IV curve before photoexcitation, and then some different IV curve after photoexcitation that decays away, and the terahertz is gonna come with some time delay and sort of trace through this three-dimensional map and give you some rectified charge. And so now it gets a little trickier to undo this, and in fact, when you take these measurements, you can really confuse yourself. So this is a sort of simulated example. We just picked some IV curve that we thought would be realistic and then rectify the terahertz charge and change the pump probe time delay. And if we do that, you can see like this kind of interesting map. And then we take some cuts through and we see, well, if we happen to put our terahertz peak voltage at negative four volts, then what we see is actually pretty authentic. We could, you know, associate that with the IV curve. If we put it at positive four volts, we actually see a totally spurious, like, fake signal. It's, it's this sort of oscillations, but actually we know there's no pump probe dynamics whatsoever. So it turns out we actually have to take quite such a map in order to really figure out what's going on. But we can then apply our algorithm again. It's a little different this time, um, but we can actually undo it. So now here's this sort of IV curve that we just thought up, and here's the reconstructed one after um, applying our algorithm to the, the simulated Terrets STM data. Okay, so we think that with this, we can now not just do this sort of atomic resolution, but really get material properties out, because ultimately this is what we want, is we want it to be a tool for material science and chemistry. Okay, so one funny thing in here now is that the bandwidth of the terahertz pulse I sent in was about two terahertz. But I can resolve the uh, onset of this, which is substantially faster than two terahertz. So this was a little weird, so we wanted to dig into this. So, here you can see sort of the reconstruction in blue and the original in black of these pump probe curves. And you can see I can even go down to a 100 femtosecond decay, which is, you know, uh, I forget the Fourier transform, 100 femtoseconds, way above, <laughs> way too high. So it turns out that all this happens because it's a nonlinear response. So because you have this very nonlinear response and we sort of separate this thing out as a polynomial, the higher orders of the polynomial have extremely good time resolution, even better than, you know, not just subcycle, but way subcycle. And you can kind of see this in the, in the Fourier transform of each of these different orders. As you get to higher frequency, you get um, better time resolution out eventually. So, okay, so this led us to think about uh, something I'm trying to kind of now connect back to near field a little bit, which is that let's say I have a terahertz voltage pulse and it applies to some IV curve. I'm gonna get some current response. And one thing we mentioned in this paper is that, well, the derivative of this is actually the emitted field. So, I don't know if it's possible, but in principle, you should have some field come out that's substantially higher harmonics than, oh, time to go? Okay, I'm out. So, okay, I'll just run through this 
quickly. So you can also do terahertz uh, driving and then photoluminescence. This is nanoscale uh, terahertz emission microscopy. And I just wanted to point out that in, in this paper by Marcus Plunkel from Rupert's group, you can actually see a tunneling process as an emitted field. I'll kind of skip through these, but there are other pump probe um, situations that you can probe, such as this work from Rupert's group again, or this paper from last month by Wilson Ho. Okay, great, so this is kind of the end of my talk. I actually thought that I would finish with this, um, just in case you're curious and reading into more about Terrett's STM. I'll give you a quick reminder about my group. They're also nice, and I'll go back to this one. Okay, thank you.